MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Fluvoxamine, an inexpensive, widely available, FDA-approved medication for over 25 years, can reduce ER visits and hospitalizations in COVID-19. That's the conclusion of a randomized placebo-controlled trial with over 1,400 subjects published in The Lancet that needed to be stopped early because the endpoints were met. The question is, what is fluvoxamine? How is it working to prevent hospitalization in COVID-19 patients? And how do we get here? Let's get started, and then we'll look at this study in detail. There was a paper that was published in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, back on November 12, 2020, that was titled Fluvoxamine versus Placebo and Clinical Deterioration in Outpatients with Symptomatic COVID-19, a Randomized Clinical Trial. And honestly, this paper caught the attention of many, primarily because of the promising effect of fluvoxamine. So fluvoxamine is FDA approved for certain psychiatric conditions, but there also seems to be a part that it plays in reducing the inflammation and even cytokine storm that is implicated, at least in part, some of the hospitalizations related to COVID-19. Let's take a little bit closer look at fluvoxamine. And its major function is known as a SSRI, or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what you need to know here is that where there are nerves that transmit signals through the messenger of serotonin, you can see the serotonin, which are these green boxes, as they move through vesicles to the surface, these serotonin molecules will hit receptors on the next neuron and cause activation and a signal through the next neuron. Now, what selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do, such as fluvoxamine, is that they will block the channel that takes those serotonin molecules and reabsorb them back into the first neuron. When they block this, this effectively increases the concentration of serotonin in the synaptic cleft or in this area, causing a excitatory pattern here at the postsynaptic receptor, causing an increase in stimulation of these serotonin receptors. So overall, these medications increase serotonin in terms of cell signaling. So fluvoxamine, which was FDA approved at first in 1994, is now currently used in the United States and in many other countries for the treatment of major depressive disorder, seasonal affective disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. With any kind of medication, there are also side effects. And for fluvoxamine, they include GI side effects, sexual side effects, and insomnia. Like any other medication, there are also severe side effects that happen very rarely like suicidality and worsening depression, especially in those less than the age of 24. And in fact, there is a black box warning on this medication, just like there is with many other antidepressant medications. This is going to be prescribed by a healthcare professional, and they'll look at other medications that you might be on or that the patient might be on to make sure that they're not on other medications that increase serotonin, because that could increase the risk of serotonin syndrome. And that's basically a side effect that can cause fevers and agitation and other symptoms. So why would they ever use such a medication to see whether or not patients with symptomatic COVID-19 could get better and not need to go to the hospital? Well, that has to do with some cellular mechanisms, which we're going to talk about right now. So here we have our cell again, and this is the outside of the cell over here with the SARS-CoV-2 virus merging with the cell wall and releasing the messenger RNA into the cell. Here we've got the nucleus, and inside the nucleus we have the DNA. And we have this area in between, which is the cytosol of the cell. One thing that you have to understand is that there is something called the mitochondria. Mitochondria are these powerhouses which reside in the cytosol of the cell, and they're responsible for making energy. And they have a large intermembrane area so they can make lots of energy. And this happens through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and also through other processes that can make something called reactive oxygen species. And we talked about that early in the pandemic. These reactive oxygen species are like superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxy radicals. And these things can cause oxidative stress. 
So reactive oxygen species are generally not good for the cell to have long term, but can be used for good things, for instance, if they're killing bacteria, etc. Well, there is a protein associated with the membranes of the mitochondria known as the inositol requiring enzyme 1 alpha. We'll call it the IRE1. And this IRE1 can sense when there is stress in the cell. And through a number of complex processes, essentially what happens is IRE1 can activate a protein known as NF-kappa B, which can then go into the nucleus and cause transcription of DNA to make inflammatory factors. These would be things like cytokines, as in cytokine storm, as in what is thought to cause the mortality in COVID-19. Now, there's a lot of research in this area, and remember that reactive oxygen species here is also implicated in things like diabetes and obesity and inflammation in general. So clearly, you can see what happens when the virus invades. It can cause stress. Stress stimulates the IRE1, which then causes an increase in NF-kappa-beta, which then causes an increase in transcription and inflammatory factors, and that can cause problems with the cell shutting down and inflammation. However, there is another protein here in the membrane. This is known as sigma-1 receptor, or S1R. And as it turns out, sigma-1 receptor actually can bind with IRE1 and essentially cool it down and prevent it from doing a lot of its activity like stimulating NF-kappa-beta. So in other words, it would shut it down and also that would cause a reduction in inflammatory factors. So stimulating sigma-1 receptor would be a good thing because it would cool down IRE1. Well, as it turns out, fluvoxamine stimulates or is a ligand for S1R, and then S1R is going to cool down IRE1. And this is why scientists designed a randomized placebo-controlled trial to see whether or not fluvoxamine would improve outcomes in COVID-19 looking to see whether or not it could prevent clinical deterioration in outpatients with symptomatic COVID-19. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about sigma-1 receptor in cellular stress signaling, we'll include this article here that was published in 2019 looking at this receptor and exactly how it works and the role of sigma-1R in cellular inflammatory regulation. All right, so let's take a look at this study that was published in JAMA in November of 2020, almost a year ago. So they took 152 subjects that had COVID-19 symptoms for less than seven days and had essentially O2 saturations that were greater than 92%. And this was done in the St. Louis area. So it was in the United States. And this was done for sake of timing purposes from April of 2020 until August of 2020. The average age at this time was about 46 years of age. And interestingly, men in this study were only about 28% of the study subjects. And again, this was a double-blinded, randomized controlled trial. And they assigned two arms to this. One of them was fluvoxamine. And there were 80 subjects in this arm. And on the other side, placebo. And there were 72 subjects in this arm. Now, the fluvoxamine was dosed at 100 milligrams three times a day. And they did it for 15 days. And the endpoint was looking for worsening shortness of breath or pneumonia or an oxygen saturation that was less than 92%, or the need for supplemental oxygen to keep the oxygen saturation above 92%. And out of those 80 subjects, zero met the endpoint in the fluvoxamine group, and there were six in the placebo group. So this was a statistical significant difference with a P of less than 0.009.
What about serious adverse events? There was one serious adverse event in the intervention group and six serious adverse events in the placebo group. There were 11 other adverse events in the fluvoxamine group and 12 other adverse events in the placebo group. And when we look at the adverse events, you can see here that pneumonia was actually numerically higher in the placebo group, as was shortness of breath, whereas headache or head pain was numerically slightly higher in the intervention group. And you can look at the rest of the article to see the minor side effects that occurred in the trial. And so the paper that was published in JAMA was a relatively small study. And so what we need is a randomized placebo-controlled trial on a much larger basis to give us a more definitive answer as to whether or not fluvoxamine works in COVID-19. So enter the Together COVID-19 Clinical Trials International Collaboration with Canadian McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, and the Pontifical Catholic University in Brazil. These two universities, the trial sponsors, and a number of trial partners put together an interesting program to quickly see whether or not medications that have already been approved and in use for years could be beneficial for COVID-19. The result was this publication that was published on October 27, 2021, titled The Effect of Early Treatment with Fluvoxamine on Risk of Emergency Care and Hospitalization Among Patients with COVID-19 the TOGETHER Randomized Platform Clinical Trial. So as was mentioned, this publication was a study that took place in Brazil. And they did something interesting. This was known as a randomized, placebo-controlled, adaptive platform. So what they did was something very interesting and unique among only a few research centers in the world. They wanted to know, was there a medication that was already being used and purposed that could be repurposed very quickly to treat COVID-19? So they looked at a number of different medications, including hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, metformin, ivermectin, doxazosin, interferon lambda, and of course, the fluvoxamine trial. So each of these had their own trials, and as patients were coming in to the study, they were being randomized to these different arms. And as these arms were filling up, there were people that were looking at interim measures to see whether or not a signal was to be met. In other words, if it was shown that beyond a predetermined significance, the intervention was doing better than the placebo, then they would start to pour in more patients into that arm until the endpoint was reached. If, on the other hand, the arms were showing no statistical significance or there was no real difference that they could find at the interim results, then they stopped enrolling in those trials. And that was the adaptive portion of the TOGETHER trial. Now, interestingly, they had enrolled 244 into the hydroxychloroquine group before it was stopped because there was no difference. They enrolled 214 in the lopinavir ritonavir group before it was stopped because they really didn't detect a signal. There was 215 in the metformin group before they stopped that one for the same reason. And they enrolled 739 in the ivermectin group before it was eventually stopped because they couldn't find a detectable signal. And in the ivermectin group, they dosed with 400 micrograms per kilogram up to 90 kilograms. So the dosing schedule was three to six, six milligram tablets every 24 hours for three days. And again, these patients were started on therapy within seven days of symptoms. Now, in contradistinction to those events, after 1,497 subjects were filtered into the fluvoxamine group, it had to be stopped, not because there was no signal, but because finally an endpoint had been reached. So in the fluvoxamine group, and there was the placebo, the subjects fluvoxamine 100 milligrams orally twice a day, as opposed to in the JAMA article where they took it three times a day. And instead of taking it for 15 days, they only took it here for 10 days. There was 741 people in that group, and there was 756 in the placebo group. 
And the end point for this was looking at people going to the emergency room for more than six hours or having to be transferred to a tertiary care hospital for the care of COVID-19. And when we looked at that, out of the 741 that were intent to be started on fluvoxamine, 79 patients, or 11%, met this endpoint of the emergency room or being transferred to a tertiary hospital. Whereas in the placebo group, 119, or 16%, met that endpoint. Now, as we've said before, we need to look at the absolute risk reduction, which in this case is 5%. And therefore, the number needed to treat, which is the reciprocal, is in this case 20. So what that means is that in a risk group where you are concerned about progression of the disease to require hospitalization, if you were to treat 20 of those patients with 100 milligrams of fluvoxamine twice a day for 10 days, you could prevent one hospitalization. Now, the other aspect of this is that a 10-day course of fluvoxamine in the United States runs a total of about $4. The other thing I should mention is that we did talk about the side effects of this medication that it can cause nausea, GI upset. When we looked at how many of these subjects were able to tolerate 80% of the protocol, it went from 741 with the intention to treat down to 548. And for the placebo, it went down to 619. And of course, if you use those numbers, then these numbers here only got better and improved. You can see here they say that the findings for the primary outcome were similar for the modified intention to treat analysis with a relative risk of 0.69. What they're saying there is that there was about a 30% reduction in the primary endpoint, which we talked about. Remember, it went from 16% down to 11%. However, if you looked at the per-protocol analysis, that's where we looked at the people who actually were compliant with taking the medication. Notice that if we're looking at the intention to treat analysis, and again, this means that we're intending to treat somebody, but if they don't take the medication, we're still using them in the analysis that they at least were given the medication. And obviously, if there's a medication that is not easily well tolerated, you're not gonna get the same benefits than you would if you looked at the people who just took the medication. So if we look at the intention to treat, there were 17 deaths in the fluvoxamine group and 25 in the placebo group in the intention to treat analysis, which still is pretty good. However, if you look at those who actually stuck to the protocol at least 80% of the time, the numbers get a lot better. There was one death in the fluvoxamine group and 12 in the placebo group for the per-protocol population. Again, the per-protocol population is those that followed the protocol. They actually took the medication. They're actually able to tolerate the medication. And this distinction is helpful if we're actually trying to see whether or not this medication works, which it seems to actually be pretty powerful. So a question that you might have is whether or not fluvoxamine works better for certain subgroups like older versus younger, male versus female. And this analysis, which was predetermined, was done it's a very interesting analysis. This dotted vertical line is the line between it favoring fluvoxamine on the left of the line or favoring placebo on the right side of the line. And you can see here that for a number of different categories, for instance, age less than 50, it seemed to work just as well as it did for age greater than 50. In other words, these are the averages with these lines being the 95% confidence intervals. And you can see that if they are to one side of the line or the other, you can make a determination. Here in this case, it's on the left side of the line, and so we know that it worked well for both age less than 50 and greater than 50. It seems to have worked better for female than male because this line is including this dotted line here, and it's within the 95% confidence interval. In terms of body mass index, definitely seems to work for body mass indexes greater than 30 with a little bit of a override of the confidence interval here at the unity line for those less than 30. And you can see the other categories here as well. So for instance, cardiovascular disease, it didn't seem to matter. Use of corticosteroid therapy, there wasn't enough data because most at this time were on corticosteroid therapy. 
What about chronic kidney disease? It seemed to work well for those that did not have chronic kidney disease, not so well for those that did. There was a very large confidence interval, however. What about those that were smoking or not smoking or never smoking? It seemed to work well in terms of the confidence interval for those that had never smoked. And you can look at the rest of this data. So this study was interpreted to say that treatment with fluvoxamine at 100 milligrams twice daily for 10 days among high-risk outpatients with early diagnosed COVID-19 reduced the need for hospitalization defined as retention in a COVID-19 emergency setting or transfer to a tertiary hospital. And a tertiary hospital is a hospital that has advanced medical equipment that is able to take care of patients who are generally more sick. And that might include ventilators, dialysis, even ECMO, which is a heart-lung bypass machine. And again, if you want to know what the high-risk patients were that were included in the study, they are listed here. The key inclusion criteria were patients older than the age of 18 years of age presenting to an outpatient care setting with an acute clinical condition consistent with COVID-19 and symptoms beginning within seven days of the screening date or a positive rapid test for SARS-CoV-2 antigen done at the time of screening or patient with positive SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic test within seven days of symptom onset. Notice that patients eligible had to also have at least one of the following criterion for high risk. And you can see these here, and these include things like diabetes, known cardiovascular disease, emphysema, stage 4 chronic kidney disease on dialysis, and immunosuppression, etc. So again, this trial was not done on just anybody with COVID-19 and less than 7 days of symptoms. So I think all in all, what we have here is a very good, large, randomized trial, something that we always look for done by reputable sponsors, which have shown a very good outcome. And this is a generic medication that is a very low cost to give, so I think that's ideal. It is off-label use, but that can be done. And of course, remember, there are side effects and the black box warning that we talked about earlier in this video. But again, it's indicated here, at least in this trial, for seven days in patients who are high risk. So that's typically to be older people. And its main outcome is preventing hospitalization, which is becoming an issue in some areas where there are high cases of COVID-19. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you think of fluvoxamine. Please leave those in the comments below. And we'll put the links to these studies in the description below as well. Don't forget to follow us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.